Welcome online viewers. We have been, to say the least, very inconsistent during this time of COVID and, and church reconstruction. But it's my intention this morning that we will be pretty much consistent in having our class online uh, here forward. And we need to mention that beginning next Sunday, we will no longer be in this little classroom. Uh, we know as 150, we'll be back in the chapel. Whereas it's been very cozy here in this class, uh, I kind of like it with us closer together, but it also means we can't grow. Uh, we need to be back over there in the, the church building, and so starting next Sunday, we'll be back in the chapel, and uh, 9 o'clock instead of 8.30, which some of you will appreciate. Uh, I'm told that if we started at 10, there would be other people who would come too, but we're not doing that. Uh, <laughs> Because when you use the chapel, then there's another class to come after us. Uh, but uh, this morning, this will be the, I, I presume, the last Sunday that we'll use this room, which has served us so well. And then at 1030 in this main sanctuary, there will be a single service, uh, rededication service of the church. And the church is so glad that they've finally gotten all the permits and the church has been reconstructed and everything will be back to normal. Um, whatever normal is. Um, now, we started many weeks ago Sermon on the Mount and we have been looking at the, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 5, 3, by the way. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Okay, computer, do your thing. <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this morning we're on verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now mercy, definition, compassionate, benevolently merciful, involving thought and action. The merciful are those who express acts of mercifulness, who have this attribute as a result of the indwelling God. So mercy comes from, from in here. And there are three verses here that all say the same thing. One clear back in Hosea in the Old Testament. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This was to the Israelis who were in rebellion against the Lord. And, and the prophet speaking for the Lord, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. 
And of course, for Israel, the offerings and all these sacrifices and the rules and regulations, those were the big things, and that's what they cared the most about. <clears throat> but the thing of it is, that from their heart was missing. They didn't have mercy. And you move forward to Matthew 9, 13, and this is when <laughs> Jesus is eating with tax collectors. Can you imagine going to lunch with an IRS agent? <laughs> and the Pharisees were having a fit. How dare you eat with tax collectors? As a matter of fact, he was in the process of hiring Matthew to be one of his disciples. I know we don't call it hiring, but to put it in our own vernacular. And they were complaining and Jesus quoted that scripture. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Isn't that funny? He didn't come for the pious religionists. He came for sinners. That's us. And if you think you're so good that you're not a sinner, well, you are. And if, if you think you're keeping the rules will do it, you're wrong. Matthew 12, 7. But if you had, and this is, this is when he was <clears throat> with the disciples and they were gathering some food on the Sabbath because they were hungry. And the Pharisees said, oh, they're gathering food on the Sabbath. He says, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have condemned the guiltless. This, this is such a unique thing because we always, let's face it, even those of us who believe in grace, we still think we've got to keep the rules and and he ought to really keep the rules, don't you think? <laughs> oh, and then her over there. We, we really like the rules. Because, you know, you can make a sign and put them on the wall. And there's the rules. And if you follow these, and the Lord says, wait a minute, what's in your heart? And you see, if a person really has it in their heart, they can do the rules anyhow. Because their relationship with the Lord is going to bring them to that place. Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Amen. Now, we've had this set up for several weeks. Glenn said something to, he told me something, and I said, got to have that in the mercy class. So, Glenn, stand up and tell us your five-second story. <laughs> My brother was listening to a, a fellow that, you know, I told you when I spoke recently about how the Lord, there are some folks, he takes up and shows them things about heaven and brings them back down. And they tell what they saw. Well, this fellow, particular fellow, was speaking in a church, and, and he talked about how the Lord took him an angel, or anyway, the Lord took him to heaven, and he's seeing things. And an angel accompanied him, and uh, he saw somebody in heaven that he didn't think was going to be there. And he said that to the angel, "Well, I didn't think that guy was going to be up here." And the angel looked, turned to him, and very forcefully said, "The Lord God is merciful." And that's what I told Daryl. Thank you, Lord, you're merciful to me. Amen. I don't follow all the rules all the time like I spoke to. He's merciful to me, and he's merciful to you. And we might find several people up there that we didn't think was going to be there by our standard, but the Lord God is merciful. Amen. That's it. Amen. And the corollary to that is... We should be merciful. 
maybe I'm not using the word corollary right. That, that's true, but that's not what, that, that, that's the text, actually, the Beatitude. The opposite is, there are going to be some people that you were sure would be there who won't be. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we don't want to think about that. I mean, everybody here, well, they're all so wonderful. Well, depends on that heart relationship they have with the Lord. But, but I really, it just really, he, he said it more strongly the first time he told it to me. The Lord God is merciful. And that, that is so wonderful. There, there's so much comfort in that. Amen. That God is merciful in spite of who we are, or of what we do. And, and Jesus quoting, I would rather have mercy well, than sacrifice. Okay. You know, also mercy before judgment. We're going there. Oh well, not exactly that way, but <laughs> um, okay. There's mercy, and and I I'm considering this morning these three cousins. There's forgiveness, and there's judging. And, and I see these very similar in, in life and, and what the scripture is teaching about mercy. Matthew 18, 21, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times but up to 70 times. Seven. Times seven. I didn't finish the sentence. <laughs> what did you say? 190 times. Ah. But, but my son... Back when he was serving the Lord, and I hope that's not him ringing my phone right now, he he was in a study where they su suggested that it was seven to the seventieth power, which yeah, tell me what that was. I'll pass. Try next week. And, and I, I don't know if if that's you know, I don't know if Jesus did algebraic stuff or not. Uh, he would have been capable, obviously. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And I tried to look up what, how much money that was. Um, and it all depends on which translation you read as to how much... 10,000 talents is. You get it from one and it's so much and then you look at something else and they've got another. But it would have been millions of dollars today. But as he was not able to pay, his, command, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment must be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now that's mercy. Yeah. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which computes more or less to a day's pay. So you figure out what, what you consider a day's pay. That's about how much the guy owed him in total. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. You're lucky there's a table between us, right? <laughs> he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. 
So his fellow servant <coughs> fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. That, that really makes a lot of sense. Because <laughs> when he's in, in the prison, he's not going to be making any money. <laughs> So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion and mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you. And his master was angry and delivered him to the tor torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. How many of us are judging people that do things that we don't approve of? And we're not sending any mercy their direction. I, I, I thought of an example this morning. I guess it was in the shower. One of the, one of the guys at the, the concert, the what do you call it, concert, where we were this week and all the uh, dozens of, of quartets. And one of them said, well, I, you know, I get my messages in the shower. Well, this morning, I got this illustration in the shower. <laughs> when I, I was in chemistry class, junior in high school, did not do well. I, I went to church too much instead of doing homework. I was the preacher's kid. I you didn't have a choice. <coughs> didn't even want one. No, I loved going to church, but I, I, I took a test and I bombed on it. And when the teacher did the corrections, he made a mistake and gave me a good grade. <laughs> And I went up to him and I said, Mr. You, you gave me this grade, but I really you know, didn't deserve it. All this is wrong. And he said, okay. But that happened to me one time when I was in school and the teacher let me keep the grade that he'd given me by accident. So you keep the grade that I gave you. I didn't deserve it. It was mercy. Years later, I'm teaching in Bangala in the Bible school at Andudu. And the same thing happened to one of my students. And he came to me and says, Buana, I, I, messed, I messed up and you gave me the wrong grade. And I said, ah, I had a teacher that did that for me. And so you keep the grade that I gave you. That was mercy. Now I've got to remember the flip side of this. Oh my, I, I, had, I had just the opposite. You see, I don't write things down in the shower. <laughs> but these, these are mercies. What? I said, welcome to the crowd. <laughs> and once you step out, you don't remember. <laughs> and there was an illustration of just exactly the opposite. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> when we came back from Africa, we we spent six months at, at uh, 
the, the Spanish school down in Southern Cal, and right now I can't quite say the name of the school, Latin American Bible Institute. And here's this African missionary teaching in a Spanish Bible school. Apparently there were some people who didn't think that was quite appropriate, but they had an English section. And, and I was teaching some course, and I believe that, that when you teach and you give a test, the test is a very important part of the learning process. And I would frequently, when there was a, a point that I really wanted to drive home, you know, I'd write it on the blackboard. Remember what those were? <laughs> <laughs> and then I would write beside it, test. And I would tell them throughout the, the semester, if I write test, it will be on the test because this is a major point. And in Bangala, I would write, examine. I, I, I've always done that. And I always, when I gave a test, the very next time the class met, we went over the test. Because I only put stuff on the test that I really wanted them to learn. And I think it was probably the last test I've given. There in La Puente at Latin American Bible Institute. And it was all true false. I don't like writing false statements because that could be remembered as, oh yeah, da 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 da. So the one time in my life I did an all true false test and all the answers were true. true. Because I wanted them to remember all those key points. I didn't believe in writing gotcha questions. I didn't want to trick them to, to make them miss some questions. I wanted them to learn the main points of the class. Aren't you glad we don't have tests in here? <laughs> and, and, and I, of course, that drives especially good students crazy when they're, all the answers are yeah. true because you know there's going to be some false answers. So actually, that's almost a gotcha thing when you, everything is true. But there was one student who, who thought he was better than the other students. He didn't necessarily come to class. He, he didn't participate. But he was a hot shot in the school. I mean, he really was. I even talked to the president of the school. I said, I don't know what to do about this guy. He's a great on the curve because he wanted to protect him, you know, that he, that, he, that he wouldn't fail. And so we came to this, uh, may have been the, uh, the final test. They were all true. He didn't even come for the test. And so I saw him later and I said, you weren't there for the test. Do you want to take it? By now, he's heard from the other students, they're all true. <laughs> so we made it time for him to come and take the next, the, the test. And he shows up, you know, this stupid teacher. <laughs> but what he didn't realize is the teacher's test was in the computer, and it doesn't take much to change a true statement to a false statement. With all false. So he got the same test. It had just been manipulated enough that there were enough false answers in there to fail the, the, the test. And of course, you know, true, 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 true. Okay, I'm done, teacher. Didn't even read it. Right. I didn't have mercy. And if if you look in this little, I don't think there's any way we're going to get to this. Um, which one is it? Okay, at least in, in yours is the first one. A critical eye. A critical eye 
has tender hearts. Jesus calls you to both. If you have the first without the second, you'll create an atmosphere of harshness and hostility. And that's awful. All you have is a, criti a, 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 a critical eye. It's terrible. But if you have only the second without the first, you'll create an atmosphere of tolerance and compromise. And, and he had gotten used to the idea that the president had, well, just grade on the curve, you know, and let him through. You see, that's not mercy. That's, that's teaching him that he doesn't need to, to study the course. He doesn't need to do the work to get through the Bible school. And I flunked him. I, I, he flunked the whole course. I always wondered, because then I left that school and went and pastored in Glendale, or Riverside. <laughs> I always wondered if the president changed my grade, because he was the only guy who knew how to play the, the, the keyboard, so we had to protect him. No, that's, that's not mercy. You see, what, what happened to my chemistry teacher from him to me and the Bangala student, that was mercy. Because the student came and acknowledged, I failed. And there was mercy extended. But the one who cheated and had no intention of making things right, he suffered the consequences. So you get the difference between mercy and slipshod? Okay, there it came. Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. You will be, uh, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. How critical are you? That's our word for it. We don't very often use the word judge. But boy, can we crit criticize. We, we just, I, I think it's kind of a Sturgeon family tendency to be critics. And I inherited that. And I can be pretty critical. And it's not good. Because the Lord is going to balance it out how I criticize them. Someone over here is going to criticize me with that same measure. Probably not the same people. They may not even know what I, you know, I, I think if, if you were with, with Glenn and me down in, in Visalia this week, you probably heard Daryl critique some of those people. Um, some of them positive, some of them negative. Oh, then I suppose some people are going to have some critiques of the ABC teaching. It's going to be like what I did to others. Of course, my critiques were all constructive. <laughs> <laughs> the way I read it, there's only one judge. That's God. But we do judge without without authority. You've got to realize that you're not the judge. Though. Romans 14, 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise 
him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? I, I think I have this story right. <clears throat> My folks pastored up in Auburn, built the, the church out on Highway, Highway 49, and above the church was a parsonage that we built to live in, and, and it was a really nice house. And Dad had someone who was really good at hardwood. You guys are old enough to probably remember there used to be hardwood floors, not not this plastic stuff you put down. And this guy, this guy was a superb hardwood floor layer. And and the pieces of wood would come in short pieces and longer pieces and longer pieces. But what made the floor look the nicest is where you put the short pieces together and it you know it, it really looked nice. And and he did a great job of it. And my mom loved her hardwood floor. Well, eventually they left that church and moved to Southern California. And another pastor came and he had grandchildren who crawled on the floor. And so he put carpet over my mom's hardwood floor. A lot of people do that. And she didn't have to live there anymore. She never had to see it again. But she could not forgive him for ruining that hardwood floor. And one day she was praying and the Lord spoke to her these words that you see in yellow. Who are you to judge another man's servants? It's none of your business what happens to that floor. Stop judging. I would love to go back up to that house and see if that hardwood floor has been exposed or if it's still covered. It, it would be... Uh, where, you know, in this day and age, if they could uncover it, they would see that oh, they have okay. a very valuable floor. Who are you to judge another man's servant? Now there I picked on my poor mom. She was a godly lady. At least, at least she heard from the Lord and stopped it. To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able, for God is able to make him stand. And truth of the matter is, if you're judging and, and trying to fix them, it may actually interfere with what God wants to do for them. One person esteems one day above another; another esteems every day alike. <laughs> Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Now take, for instance, Christian music of today. Some of my favorite Christian music on YouTube are Seventh-day Adventists. They've, they've got great music that goes back to the 50s. Now they might judge us for being here on Sunday. I don't judge them for, for doing their thing on Saturday, but I love their music, and, and I, I think they're wonderful people. Um, and truth matters, we shouldn't be judging each other on the subject. One person esteems one day above another, and another esteems every day alike. And that's where I stand on that subject. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he who gives God thanks, he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. In, in, in those Bible days that, that Paul had to deal with, there was the problem of, of special feast days and seventh day, 
and there was the problem of what you can eat and what you can't eat. And, and the, the Jews, they really had those rules. And if you didn't follow their rules, you, you just didn't deserve to be alive. And there, there's another scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 33. I'm not going to take the time to, to read all of that. It basically is saying the same thing as we have here in Romans 14 about not judging. Stop judging. Start healing. Wouldn't that be interesting? The person that you've been tearing down, if instead you started building them up. No, we're not going to read that. Now, you've got me, and then there's the other guy. And how we treat each other. In mercy, in forgiving, and in judging. These three cousins that are so closely related that the rules are pretty much the same. And the other guy, he has mercy, forgiving, and judging. And what the scripture distinctly teaches I worked too hard to make this work <laughs> on the other computer, but the, that computer won't talk to this TV. There we go. <laughs> Might as well do the last one. <laughs> what goes for one goes for the other. What goes for them goes for the other. It's, it, it's a two-way street. As I have mercy for others, Others will have mercy for me. As I forgive, I will be forgiven. As I refuse to forgive, I will not be forgiven. In the Lord's sample prayer, the one he told, uh, gave to his disciples to, to use as an example for praying, it says in it, God, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. In other words, if you want God to forgive you for your trespasses, you better forgive the other for their trespasses. And we're going to get there again when, when we get to the Lord's Prayer here in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I'm sure I'll repeat this again then. You, you know, you you know the Lord's prayer. It says, "Forgive us our forgive us our debt." We others. forgive. And and then you know it basically says, "Amen." And the very next verse, he goes back to that one point and says, "If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you." Wow. You better forgive. Yeah, but do you know what he did to me? Does it matter? Write it off. It's called forgive. Judge. Forgive. Mercy. It goes both ways. There's another item with, about forgiving. Who pays the most for not forgiving? The one you don't forgive or the one who does forgive? I mean, uh, the one who, who is a receiver of the, of the rebuke. It's you who do the rebuking. It will cause pain and sorrow and sickness in your body, and it, it won't affect him at all. So true. It, it eats you up inside. Um... Uh, you can raise your hand or not. Uh, I'll ask it as a rhetorical question. How many of you have had something that you really struggled with and finally you forgave it? And immediately after you genuinely forgave it, you found you fell about 20 pounds lighter. 
Bridge of my hand. It, forgiving is such a such a burden taken off of you. And and it just eats you up inside if if you don't forgive. Um and and giving mercy and judging. Just you know, if there's a problem, you, you know how how bad old Vern over here is to me. <laughs> Shouldn't sit on the front row. <laughs> I've had this happen for years. <laughs> <laughs> been the guy in front. <clears throat> when uh, I said all that, I wonder where I was going. <laughs> You, <clears throat> he, you know, he's really mean to me, but I forgive him anyhow. <laughs> yeah, that's not forgiving. But when I genuinely forgive him, even though he really was mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and and my my oh, expression is, give it to God, you, Lord. Lord. You have to deal with Vern. I can't. <laughs> No, next Sunday someone else needs to sit up front, so I'll pick on them and sit up front. But he always sits up front. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> it's it's just amazing because the truth of the matter is, let's face it, whether it's judging or forgiving, the truth of the matter is the person did something wrong. I, I, can, I, I can imagine, you know, you've got a sister or a brother that they, they've just been terrible. And they really have. That's when you forgive. If they haven't really done anything wrong, there isn't anything to forgive. So it's, it's the wrong stuff. You could list it. You could take it to the bank. You could take it to court and win. Instead, you say, no, I forgive. And, and we're done because, well, the clock says we are. Uh, I had a good thought there. It wasn't a part of the lesson, but it was a good thought to, to wrap up with. But he took me down there to those late nights and my brain is still trying to catch up on the sleep that I lost in Visalia. He hasn't um, forgiven you yet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was the instigator of the, of the trip. <clears throat> it's his fault. <laughs> You're sitting on the front row. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, he catches it too, you know. Um, <clears throat> Well, that was a fun point that, that's just going to have to go unfunded. Lord, thank you for this day. May we learn that as we are merciful, we shall receive mercy. That as we forgive, we shall be forgiven. That as we judge not, we shall not be judged. And Lord, we pray that, that you would drive this home in our hearts and help us to realize when we're when we're being unforgiving and give us the grace in our own spirits to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, next Sunday... <coughs> in the chapel.